Hearty welcome to those of you who, those of you who have just joined us. I'm David Biet, director of the Canada Institute. Um, and I'm very happy to have this group today on cooperation at the Canada-U.S. border, confronting challenges and measuring progress. Um, we will have two panels this afternoon. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, again, please turn your Blackberries off. This room is particularly bad in electronic interference, and we are webcasting this. Um, and it will be posted, archived on the web soon. Um, so look for it if you'd like to, not sure who said what. Um, washrooms are out to the left here. We'll have coffee at the break. And I will now turn this over to Michael Abensauer, who is with the Quebec office in Washington. And he will be chairing this session. Michael. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Abensauer, and I'm one of the representatives from the Government of Quebec office here in Washington. Uh, I'm happy to moderate today's panel, first panel entitled Meeting Federal Border Mandates, State and Provincial Initiatives. Uh, first, I'd like to thank David, Mia, and his team at the Cannon Institute for not only hosting us here today at the Wilson Center, but for organizing what I consider a very timely and very important conference on the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative and the future of cross-border security between Canada and the United States. Uh, with a new incoming president in Congress, this is a great time to take a step back and look back at some border management policy over the last couple of years, see what's worked, see what hasn't, and see what we can improve on. Before I introduce the first of our panelists, I'd like to give some brief background on the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative and how it's affected us all. WHTI, or WITI as some of us like to call it, was born out of the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act of 2004 as part of Congress's efforts to not only implement some of the 9-11 panel's recommendations, but to reform the intelligence community. One of these recommendations was to improve border security by establishing a system by which Americans returning to the U.S. from travel within the Western Hemisphere would have to provide border officers with documentation verifying their identities. The recommendation also called for identical screening measures to be enacted for visitors to the U.S. coming from the rest of the hemisphere, i.e. Canada, Mexico, and the Caribbean. While many specifics of the recommendation had yet to be figured out, the first issue addressed was in deciding which document should be used. For the two departments tasked in implementing WHTI, Homeland Security and State, the answer was obvious, the passport, as it was the only existing document that was not only widely available, but already loaded with the appropriate biometric technology required. It quickly dawned on a great many people, specifically those who happen to live and work near the northern border, that this seemingly innocuous proposal was going to fundamentally alter the flow of people between Canada and the U.S. It wasn't just ferry, boat, and tour operators who were cringing at what was nicknamed the passport rule, but tourism boards, chambers of commerce, and multinationals like FedEx, Marriott, and Disney who were wondering what impact this was going to have for them. On the Canadian side, you can only imagine the anxiety that was felt by the tourism and travel industry as they looked south and saw that only 25% of Americans at the time actually had passports. Asking somebody to pay upwards of $97 to purchase one just so they can come across and see friends or relatives or go catch a senator's game in Ottawa was a tough sell. After a period of reflection and hand wringing, something very interesting happened. A cross-border coalition of private and public stakeholders, along with state and provincial governments, mobilized to weigh in on a federal mandate. Though it took some time, everybody eventually agreed that WHTI wasn't going away anytime soon, and that in order to both secure the borders and allow the smooth flow of traffic to continue, the initiative would have to be modified. The challenge was that everybody from Congress, Homeland Security, state, the states and provinces on down the line all had their own vision as to exactly what should be done. When the dust had settled, a consensus emerged over two new ideas. Expand the list of WHTI compliant documents to include enhanced driver's licenses and other trusted, trusted travel programs, and put into place a realistic time frame within which to make all of this work. For most, the tale would end there, but WHTI is like an onion. The more layers you peel, the harder you cry. <laughs> <laughs> While EDLs appeared simple documents on the surface, basically a license with the addition of citizenship requirements and an RFID biometric chip, the reality is far more complicated. By adding these elements, the core function of the ubiquitous driver's license has changed, leading to a host of unforeseen issues such as added costs, concerns over privacy and safeguards, infrastructure to process them at the border, and so on and so forth. For Quebec, the decision to go ahead and roll out an EDL was just the first in a series of increasingly complicated steps. As a provincial jurisdiction, just like in the states, the design, manufacture, and issuance of licenses is a relatively turnkey operation. Once a driver's license transforms into an EDL, however, strange things start happening. Not only were we thrust into consultations with the Canadian federal government and its attendant border and security <coughs> agencies, but the U.S. federal government also wanted to talk to us about everything from technology specifications to the security of the actual manufacturing plants. 
Other issues that I dare not touch are what happens at the border crossings in terms of staffing, training, and equipment as another conference altogether. Like many stories about legislation in Washington, WHCI is a cautionary tale of unintended consequences. More than five years since WHCI became part of my daily acronym regimen, I'm glad to say in this case at least we've seen unprecedented level of cooperation generated among states and provinces, starting with the first EDLs in Washington State and British Columbia on the West Coast. I'm hopeful that the groundwork that gave rise to such fruitful collaboration between all levels of governments will remain in the coming years as new border security and trade issues are, are tackled. For my first panelists, I would like to uh, welcome Wayne Benjamin, who's the Executive Deputy Commissioner of the New York DMV, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about how EDLs in New York are proceeding and what needs to be done at the border crossings there. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to try to stand. Uh, as an attorney, it's just more comfortable uh, <laughs> for me to do this. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for inviting me here today as a representative of New York State Governor David Patterson and New York State DMV Commissioner David Swartz. This is the uh, map of the New York State, and the red here is the border with some of the major border crossings uh, marked. As you can see, that there is uh, many border crossings here. That's the Buffalo area. Uh, the Peace Bridge is there. I actually was at the Peace Bridge uh, on the 16th of September when we rolled out the EDLs uh, in New York State at all 118 offices, and I was there on the 24th of November when the RFID uh, readers went live. So it's, it's an area of extreme uh, uh, commerce and extreme importance to the state of New York. And we're here today to talk about our neighbor to the north and the challenges we faced as a motor vehicle agency in developing a new product to help our citizens in meeting federal border mandates. Canada is by far the United States' most important trading partner with exports more than Mexico, Japan, and China combined. The New York-Canadian border is 445 miles long, and there are 17 staffed land crossings into Ontario and Quebec, including four of the top 39 in all of the United States. New York-Canadian commerce relationship, specifically involving the Providence's of Ontario and Quebec is vital to the health of the New York State economy. And to illustrate the importance of our relationship, let me share some statistics. In 2007, more than $3 billion worth of exports to Canada passed through the five bridges in Buffalo alone, with the second largest volume of exports in the entire United States. More than 400,000 New York State jobs are supported by U.S. Canadian trade. In 2007, 2.5 million Canadians visited New York State and spent more than $679 million. 1.7 million New Yorkers visited Canada in 2007, spending $561 million. New York State Governor Patterson and DMV Commissioner Swartz, who is a lifetime Buffalo resident, have a keen understanding of the importance of cross border commerce to the United States and New York State. They are committed to fostering commerce while also understanding that we must act to preserve security. The solution was to develop an enhanced driver's license or EDL. Issuing the EDL was one of the largest single projects undertaken in New York State DMV's history. Indeed, it represents the most radical change in our licensing process since the 1984 edition of a photo license. We accomplished much in a very, very short period of time. In less than a year, we went from determining to go forward with an EDL to actual implementation. And one of the reasons that the Department of Homeland Security was willing to work expeditiously with New York State on developing the EDL was that New York State had one of the most secure issuance processes in the nation. Our development of an EDL not only meets all federal witty requirements, but it satisfies New York's security goals of one driver one license. In fact, development of the EDL gave us an opportunity to revisit our issuing policies and procedures in a way that further strengthened our already secure document. For example, we incorporated document authentication workstations, and that's what the picture is. These are devices that we use now to authenticate documents that are brought in, such as passports, such as licenses from other states, and uh, social security cards. The document workstation has over 
1,200 source documents in its database that are updated quarterly and that can check. I mean, when you think of all the iterations of passports and licenses that states have, they're constantly going through a procedure where they're updating their licenses, yet all the legacy documents are still valid. Those have to all be in the database to be checked when someone comes in with a document and says, this document represents who I am. These uh, authentication statements subject, uh, stations subject the document to various light sources, and they can check not only that the document is authentic, but whether or not it's been altered under the various light sources. So that's one of the things that we've done. We've also instituted a procedure we call electronic two-stop, and that just very simply means that you can't have collusion with a uh, motor vehicle clerk uh, in terms of getting a document through because you don't know who those clerks are because you're going to be subject to a random ticketing. You're going to get a ticket. You're going to go to one stop with the clerk. You're going to present your documentation. The clerk is going to verify those documents. And then you're going to get another ticket that randomly is going to assign you to another clerk where the same documents, you get the documents back, you have to hand them in again, and then they're checked with electronically against each other to make sure that they're proper. And we have found that very, very useful in preventing fraud. And lastly, we're exploring facial recognition technology. Last year, we conducted a pilot where we took one million of our photographs and we subjected them to a one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, comparison to see if people had duplicate licenses. Of the one million, I'm happy to report that we only uncovered 100 people with multiple licenses. That's a very, very small percentage in New York State. But we found one that was on the terrorist watch list. These people have been prosecuted. They've been, some of them have been arrested. And now we're looking to roll out the full facial techno um, uh, recognition technology in June of next year. The other thing, of course, we did to be compliant with the witty requirements is we embedded an RFID tag inside of our license document. And we developed systems for data exchange with Customs and Border Protection. We conducted background checks of over 1,900 state and county DMV staff. In New York State, we have state-run DMV offices and we have county-run DMV offices. There are 62 counties in New York State. Of those 51, in 51 counties, county employees actually run the DMVs as agents of, New York, of the New York State mm -hmm. Department of Motor Vehicles. In the other 11, we run the offices. So those county employees also had to be vetted so that they could work on EDLs and background checks had to be done for all of those employees. And interestingly, we also had to work with the unions. You know, there's state unions that, that involve uh, these workers and we had to, we work in partnership with our unions and I'm happy to say that because of that, because the New York State DMV has had a great relationship with its unions, we were able to sit down and hammer out an agreement by which only employees that were vetted uh, could and were citizens could work on EDLs and we had a criteria developed so that if people's background checks came up with hits that violated the hazmat standards for, for uh, uh, commercial drivers, uh, we would go through a procedure of transferring them or taking other action that the unions were, were agreeable to. So we worked at this particular agreement and, um, and were able to, to get that done in a manner that also uh, DHS supported. Uh, we did all of this, not only in partnership with DHS, but with, in partnership with the provinces of Ontario and Quebec, and we were talking with them all along. This is the New York State EDL. And in developing its EDL, New York opted to keep a design and material similar to its current license because we believe that the current New York State license is unique and secure and to minimize retraining requirements <coughs> for staff and law enforcement. Let me just show you a couple of the things. You probably, you, you probably can't see that, but that's the word enhanced right there in that red bar which shows that it is enhanced. That's one of the requirements of WITI. The other thing is the flag to denote citizenship. 
Uh, we also increased uh, the amount of uh, a space that we could put a, a, so we could put a person's full name, including their middle name, on there and their residence, uh, their full residence. On, on the back of the license, we were more challenged because there was a real estate issue. Uh, we did have a 1D barcode uh, on the top and the 2D barcode, which you see there. Uh, on the bottom, we, had, we took the 1D barcode off, um, which caused some issues. I'll get to them in, in, in a couple of seconds. The 2D barcode is now on top, and there is the machine-readable zone, the, the OCR text that's similar to what you see in a passport. This is the license under UV light to show you just some of the security features because we have blended UV. That's the seal of the state of New York and the tiara that's, that's on top of the, uh, the, the head is a smaller seal. Uh, and there are, other, there are many other um, security features in, in the license. Uh, in order to co incorporate the RFID tag, we opted for a sandwich Teslin substrate. And uh, we did that over the more expensive polycarbonate alternatives which were being pushed. And to our knowledge, that had and, and still has never ever been done before. A Teslin uh, sandwich has never been used, so we were sort of worried about it a little bit, but our vendor uh, assured us that it would be uh, properly tested, and uh, it was, and as of right now, uh, it's working beautifully, so we're very, very pleased about it. As a matter of fact, uh, Customs and Border Protection uh, uh, indicated when I was at the Peace Bridge that uh, the, the uh, EDLs, New York EDLs, were actually registering uh, better than the other trusted travel cards, so we're very proud of that, <laughs> that fact. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but... Uh, <laughs> All right, we, we, you know, the 1D barcode, as I said, was, was over there. The 1D barcode, uh, you know, bars and other establishments were swiping that to make sure that kids were, were, you know, not altering the information on the front of the card because that gave a, a birth date out. And uh, we had some pushback when we took that off. And there were newspaper articles about it and stuff. And uh, some of the legislature legislators in the state of New York were upset about it, but we pointed out that the new configuration meets national licensing standards established by AMVA, the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administers, Administrators, and adopted by 45 of the 50 states. We also pointed out that proof of age is best confirmed by checking the date of birth on the front of the license while using a photograph to confirm the customer's identity and quickly verifying that the visible security features are intact. The 2D barcode contains information that is on the front of the license, including the person's birth date, and with updated software or equipment, it also can be scanned by an establishment in the same manner that the 1D barcode was previously scanned. Incidentally, you can now download 1D barcodes from the internet. So that's how scary the 1D barcode became in terms of a security feature. It's just not there anymore. The UV uh, feature is called a level two security feature, which means that it requires special tools to display. Um, now that we had the product, the challenge was to predict demand. We just didn't know how many people were going to buy this. And we're finding now that about 3% of people conducting licenses licensing transactions or opting for the EDL, and 34% are choosing to get it before their current license expires. We've issued, since we started issuing EDLs, which was two and a half months ago, we've issued almost 11,000. We've collected over $300,000 in revenue. Our marketing, we use a soft marketing approach. We wanted to make sure that people understood what they had to bring in to get their EDL when they came into the Department of Motor Vehicle offices. But now we're going to, starting in January, start to really push on the marketing using the June 1st, 2009 deadline as sort of a hammer to make people understand that they really need to get this document if they're going to travel over in into Canada and back. And we anticipate that sales will get, will go up uh, in the following months. And also we have a licensing cycle, which basically means that a large volume of our licenses will come due for renewal uh, in the first couple of months of 2009. What we're trying to do is educate people and say, when your license comes for renewal, don't renew it, make it into an EDL. 
So we, we're putting inserts in the licensing renewal notices, and we're trying to get the word out through various media so that people understand that. Just let me talk a little bit about RFID technology. It results, of course, in faster, more accurate border transactions with reduced waiting times and pollution, and it allows CBP agents more time to do their jobs. I, was, I, I had the privilege of going into one of the booths when they rolled out the, uh, the RFID, when RFID went live in Buffalo, and uh, it, 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 when you come through with the card, it just populates the area. It's like, it's like electronically sending your, your taxes to the IRS. You don't have to worry about keyboarding mistakes. You don't have to worry about, about the time it takes to, to put in the information. It's all there, and it allows the agents to do their job and concentrate more on questioning people. And the privacy and security issues concerning the use of RFID tags um, are, are largely myths. Uh, it's not used for tracking people whereabouts. The Gen 2 technology uh, w requires the use of readers to activate the tag <clears throat> because the tag itself has no power source. And I call, I like, we like to call it a tag instead of a chip. When you talk about a chip, people think, gee, a chip, that has information on it. It really doesn't. The RFID tag has a number, and that's all it broadcasts is a unique number. That number is then read by CBP agents, and it goes to the DHS database, which then pulls up the information. But to address the security concerns, we supply a sleeve with every EDL that we send out. If you put the EDL in the sleeve, it prevents it from being read anywhere at any time. All right, advantages of EDL. It's a driver's license and also, you know, serves as a passport. It's an identity document. You can use it to fly domestically like I did today, thankfully. They looked at it. They thought it was neat. I, you know, I, was, I was happy they knew what it was. A little bit worried there. Uh, you can cross land and sea borders in the Western Hemisphere. It can be obtained quickly, usually in less than two weeks. It's more like eight days. That's what it takes New York State DMV to, to get it. My EDL came in eight days to me, and that's, that's the usual time. And it's less expensive. It's $30 more on, in addition to your regular licensing fee. So if you're renewing your license in New York State, there's a $50 charge for eight years, and then you pay an extra $30 to get, to get an EDL, and it fits in your wallet. EDLs do not require their holders to undergo background checks like the Century, Nexus, and Fast cards. cards. EDL photos are included free as part of the license issuing process, not like passport photos, which you generally have to pay for, although I actually made mine at home, and it was accepted. <laughs> yeah. Nor does EDL charge an additional fee for expedited processing. In summary, New York's EDL is vital to commerce in the upstate New York economy. It facilitates border crossings and serves as a witty compliant alternative to a more expensive and less convenient passport. New York's EDL represents an elegant solution to the dynamic tension between cross-border commerce, security, and convenience. It offers a secure, facilitative, and cost-competitive solution that meets all of New York State's, DHS's, and the witty rules and requirements. And on behalf of New York State Governor David Patterson and New York State Commissioner of Motor Vehicles David Swartz. And I thank you here. I thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak about New York CDL. Thanks very much. Thank you, Wayne. The next panelist is Ken Hoplinter, who's president and CEO of the Bellingham Whatcom Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And he'll be uh, talking a little bit about what's going on in that particular neck of the woods. Thanks, Michael. Um, I, uh, I guess I'm the, the token private sector guy. I'm neither government or education, so I'm not, not here to help you or to educate you. I'm here to part you with your money. <laughs> um, 
what I want to talk about a little bit today is uh, not not just a little bit about our coalition, the best coalition, um, and the EDL in Washington State and the province of British Columbia, uh, but give you a little background and history on how we got to where we are with the EDLs. You know, sort of over the last four years, the work that's been done, um, both uh, in the private sector and in government, to get us to this point. Should have asked him how to use this before we started here. Hey, what a deal. All right. So the, uh, the BEST Coalition is a partnership that was formed almost immediately after WHTI was, uh, was passed. Um, originally, it was three organizations, my Chamber of Commerce in Bellingham, Washington, which sits uh, uh, about uh, 45 minutes south of Vancouver, British Columbia, and covers all four of the major border crossings uh, on the West Coast. Um, my uh, counterparts at the Detroit Regional Chamber uh, and the Chamber of Commerce for Buffalo, which is the Buffalo Niagara Partnership. Uh, we grew to uh, about 125 members in 10 states and five provinces. Um, and it really is a grassroots group. There is no staffing for it, although it's run out of my office. Uh, and the whole idea was to get folks on the ground in the border regions working together on trying to find solutions to what we saw as a real problem. And it was identified by Michael uh, earlier. Once WHTI was announced, we began to look at the economic harm a small community like ours uh, felt that uh, would, would, would occur because of the difficulties in getting people back and forth over the border uh, with the new documents that were going to be required. Our original concept uh, was to uh, piggyback on the Real ID law, uh, which passed uh, about five months after WHTI uh, went through Congress. Um, and originally, the whole idea behind Re Real ID was that it was going to be a secure uh, identity card uh, that the federal government would approve for what it was called federal ID purposes. Uh, and it was passed on to the states, and the states were told you're going to have to move forward on this. And when you, and, you know, when you initially talk about federal ID purposes, you think, well, you know, I, I don't normally go into uh, uh, nuclear facilities or something, so I don't know that it's really going to be all that important to me. But when you start thinking about flying domestically, uh, going into federal buildings like courthouses, these are all things that you would have to have a federally approved ID to be able to enter. And so the whole idea, I think, uh, originally with the Real ID was states are going to have to comply with this because if they don't, their citizens won't be able to use their driver's licenses uh, for these federal purposes. Well, unfortunately, uh, even though uh, we immediately picked up on that and said, great, if the federal government has already said Real ID is the way to go, why can't we use those documents to cross the land border? Let's push that idea because the driver's license is something that everyone already carries in their wallet. Um, we didn't want an ID that you had to think about. We wanted an ID that you already had. It wasn't a passport. It wasn't something that you had to get out of the safe. You carried it with you all the time. So those of us in border regions could very easily go back and forth over the border. Well, as we went down the pike, it became very clear that a number of states weren't going to move forward with it uh, quite as easily as we had hoped. Uh, so we needed to come up with another concept of, uh, of how to, uh, to, to get driver's licenses moving as, as a means of being able to cross the border. Uh, just a little bit of background quickly on BEST before I, uh, I uh, move forward. Um, so we, uh, we got together in July of 05. Over the course of 05, formed the group. And then uh, throughout 06 and into 07, uh, did about five full fly-ins to D.C., uh, completely um, uh, populated with uh, business folks and folks from chambers of commerce across both countries, um, and uh, uh, basically spent uh, days and days on the Hill trying to explain to uh, congressmen from uh, middle America who uh, have never crossed the border that the northern border is different than the southern border. There's not, you know, millions of economic refugees streaming over all the time that, you know, we, 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 we need to look at that border a little differently and, and begin to have some dialogue about some of the ways that we think uh, they could look at the, uh, the northern border a little differently. So the breakthrough on EDLs, um, we believe, really came in the summer of 2006. Uh, at a conference in Edmonton, Alberta, where uh, then Public Safety Minister Stockwell Day uh, and Secretary Chertoff were uh, at a joint uh, appearance at a conference. And Secretary Chertoff said that he thought a real ID solution to WHTI would be a way to go. And so we sort of took that as uh, at least the, the blessing for the concept. Um, and a number of organizations and state governments began to pick up on it from there. Uh, the first ones to move forward on it were uh, uh, Governor Christine Gregoire from the state of Washington uh, and her counterpart from British Columbia, uh, Premier Campbell. 
and uh, they had a summit shortly after that um, that meeting in Edmonton. Um, and out of the summit, there were five items in their joint agreement. And the number one item was that they both agreed that they would produce uh, driver's licenses in their jurisdictions that would be acceptable for crossing the border. Um, the uh, uh, the idea from there. Um, really entered into a lot of uh, negotiations directly between the state of Washington um, and uh, the federal government in the U.S. Um, and so uh, we sort of stepped away from that point. But the concept they came up with uh, is uh, there on the screen. And I won't get into a lot of the specifics because Wayne covered um, the stuff that's going on in uh, New York State. A lot of the specifics and the licenses are the same. Uh, I guess just a couple of things I'll mention. Uh, we are uh, almost at 50,000 licenses in circulation. Uh, we just started the program in uh, end of January, so about uh, 10 months worth of work for a fairly small state. So we're very pleased with the uptake of the license. And in fact, the uptake has been so good uh, that in the uh, uh, session of our legislature this year, in uh, roughly about March, uh, the legislature appropriated an additional couple million dollars into the program for training because uh, the capacity was such that we were starting to see up six to eight week wait times for people to get their appointment to go get their EDL. There were so many people that wanted to get the, uh, the enhanced driver's license. Um, I want to piggyback on uh, Wayne's comments about the RFID chip. Um, uh, the RFID chip has a random 96-digit number on it that points to a database. It contains no personal information. So in that sense, it's actually safer than the passport is. Uh, but I think the most important thing with it is that for those uh, folks uh, out in the world who are, are concerned and choose to wear tinfoil hats, we do have a tinfoil sleeve to put the license in so you don't have to worry about it being read. Um, one of the ways that we uh, made it a very appetizing thing for uh, folks in Washington State to get was by um, uh, helping them to see that by getting the EDL, they could actually avoid those wonderful lines at the licensing authority that we also love. No offense, Wayne. Um, so, we, we don't oh, you don't have Wayne. Well, that's good. Uh, maybe you and, uh, and uh, Governor Gregoire should speak then, because unfortunately, we do have uh, some lines uh, to uh, to be able to get driver's licenses, but with EDL, you don't. Uh, because you got an appointment, uh, you came in at your appointed time, you were immediately helped. Um, I waited about uh, two months into the process so that I could sort of see how it worked uh, once they worked the bugs out. Um, and uh, from the d moment that I walked in, it took uh, less than 15 minutes and I was out the door, which uh, I think is an all-time record for, for me at the, uh, at the DMV. So. Um, the, uh, the other important thing for Washington State is we have a little bit less time on our licenses. They're good for five years, uh, and the price point was $15 for five years above and beyond the cost of the regular driver's license. So um, it, uh, it really was a no-brainer. Uh, for 15 bucks, you got this uh, document that did all these other wonderful things, and you didn't have to wait in line as long. So uh, I think that was one of the reasons you saw such a great uptake uh, in Washington State with the license. Um, a couple of other issues, uh, just to sort of broaden the discussion before I pass it on to Catherine. Um, uh, some of the things that, as uh, best looks forward, that we've got concerns about, and we begin to discuss some of these in the other room, infrastructure. Um, uh, there's a, a, a tremendous need for infrastructure all on the northern border. We're very lucky in that our primary crossing points are just about finished with construction, although unfortunately it appears that uh, uh, the U.S. government will not have the uh, crossing at the Peace Arch done in time for the Olympics in Vancouver, which is a bit of a sore point for us. But uh, there's been a lot of money put into infrastructure in our region, uh, which is great. Um, and one of the reasons probably why uh, Nexus uh, card uptake in the Pacific Northwest uh, is higher on a percentage basis than anywhere else in the country. And in fact, half of all Nexus car holders are in the Pacific Northwest, and we only have the third largest border crossing region. Um, it's because our infrastructure is such that we have, for instance, two mile long lines so that uh, the Nexus, uh, even when there's three hour backups at the border, people still have access to the Nexus line. It makes a lot of sense for them to use it. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of the other major border crossings, you have to cross bodies of water. It adds a whole other dimension to it. But, you know, in Detroit, the largest border crossing on the northern border, they have amongst the lowest uptake of the Nexus card because the Nexus lines are, you know, like two, three hundred yards long. You have to get all the way through the tunnel at Detroit-Windsor before you get to the Nexus line. So finding ways infrastructure-wise to be able to improve on that, uh, it would be extremely helpful for the uptake of those. Um, also on EDL follow-through, you notice that uh, I talked about the, uh, the agreement between Premier Campbell and Governor Gregoire and then proceeded to tell you only about the Washington State license. That's because, unfortunately, there is not a license in British Columbia at this point. Um, what happened was that uh, in British Columbia, the licensing authority is what they call a crown corporation. It is a public-private entity. 
um, that also happens to do all of the insurance for all the vehicles in British Columbia. Um, and uh, this entity, ICBC, has chosen to not move forward with full implementation until there is a national database of birth certificates in Canada, which they're in the process of doing now. What it's meant, though, is that we're now looking at probably sometime in May before full implementation, right before implementation of WHTI. And it's beginning to be a bit of a sore point for Washington State that we've moved forward on this. We're providing Washingtonians with an additional way of being able to go north, and yet British Columbia has not followed through with its promise for those going south. Now, I shouldn't say that there is no license. They did go through phase one of the program last year where they put 500 licenses out as a trial. Those 500 were taken within less than 24 hours. So you can tell the demand in British Columbia is high. We just need to provide them with the licenses, which we haven't done yet. Secondly, I think it's important that we continue to talk about the differences between the southern and the northern border. Um, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, um, and uh, so I'm uh, passingly familiar with the southern border by more than just news reports and Lou Dobbs. Um, I can tell you that it's important that we, uh, we certainly uh, look at uh, the benefits of things like, uh, like NAFTA and the fact that we do have a tripartite relationship in uh, North America, but we also have bipartite relationships that we need to concentrate on. And continuing to go through um, the, uh, the next uh, four years as we've gone through the last eight where there is almost a mandate that the southern northern borders be looked at the same, we've got to move away from. There are different issues. Uh, both with goods and people moving. For instance, just one, um, there are far more people who walk across the border on the southern border. There's almost no one that walks across the border on the northern border. There are lots of things that are different between the two, and we need to acknowledge that, and we need to treat them differently. Uh, because if we continue to look at them the same, we're going to have the sorts of problems that we have in parts of America that aren't familiar with border regions, where they hear about problems on the southern border and assume that those problems exist on the northern border as well. Um, Third, uh, wait times. Um, I had the privilege of, uh, of uh, having breakfast in Bellingham a couple weeks ago with Ron Rainus, who is the head of the Peace Bridge in Buffalo. And we were sort of uh, sharing notes on our border crossings. And one of the things I thought was really interesting is because you cross the body of water there, uh, and the bridge authority is, a, uh, in essence, a, a non-government private entity, um, there is a, a group that sort of has a reason why they don't want long border wait times. And any time they see cars backing up a bit, they're on the phone with the appropriate port director asking for more lanes to be opened. We don't have that where I'm at, and so, for instance, uh, on Saturday night at 9 o'clock in the middle of uh, U.S. Thanksgiving weekend, we had two-and-a-half-hour lineups southbound at the Peace Arch for people who were trying to go down and go shopping. Um, we don't have it. We, we, we have great uh, um, uh, marketing of what the wait times are. I mean, you can look anywhere around Vancouver and Be Bellingham and find out what wait times are. What you can't do, though, is actually call the port director and ask them to open up some more lanes. So um, uh, sharing some information about how we do things along the border region, because there are certain areas, uh, you know, we do some things well in the Pacific Northwest that other parts of the border may want to take up, and vice versa. And we need to see, continue to look at those things, because uh, we, we can't have wait times like this. I think people, uh, people understand that there's additional security, that it's going to take longer to get across the border. But a two-and-a-half-hour wait time, especially on a Saturday night, is absolutely acceptable. Um, and finally, um, I think it's important that we do a, a better job at the government level of acknowledging the relationship between the two countries. And I was pleased to hear some of the comments that the Assistant Secretary said over lunch. Um, I would maybe add to it to say that I'm not sure that there are two countries that have a closer relationship than do the U.S. and Canada on a number of different levels. And there were some things in our partnership that he failed to mention. Uh, for instance, um, uh, you can't fly out of a major airport in Canada without actually clearing U.S. customs before you come to the U.S. The Canadian government has opened up its major airports so that U.S. customs clearances can be done there. And you don't have to be treated as an international flight when you arrive in the U.S. Um, we have outstanding partnerships between law enforcement entities all along the northern border. The integrated enforcement teams have done an amazing job of working together on everything from drug interdiction to attempting to close off gaps in the border that people are, are crossing there in between the major border crossings. These folks meet on a regular basis all across the border, and I think we need to acknowledge the fact that there is great work being done there. 
And frankly, the one that always surprises me that isn't mentioned is NORAD. I mean, we have for years had the ability to jointly work together in the defense of, our, of, uh, of the skies here in North America. So looking at ways that, uh, as the Assistant Secretary said, we can maybe push the borders out, look at uh, uh, North America um, as a whole for who's coming in from other parts of the world, get agreement there on who we're allowing in so that we have less of the issue on the 49th parallel. Uh, for those of us who live along the border, it would be great because, uh, um, you know, uh, it uh, oftentimes for us when, uh, when I'm crossing the border uh, seems a bit odd. Uh, you can travel between the District of Columbia and Virginia without a problem except for traffic, um, whereas uh, two blocks north of my house is the Canadian border, and for me to pop over to the store in White Rock sometimes can take a significant period of time and uh, a bit of uh, a check as well. Um, I come from a very by uh, border family. Uh, my wife is Canadian. I'm American. Uh, our offspring are dual citizens. So I'm not sure which way to go. Uh, my wife works in Vancouver. I work in Bellingham. So we're back and forth all the time. Uh, and we're not unique. There are a lot of families that are like that. And uh, we're going to continue to do what we can with all of our partners in the BEST Coalition uh, to address the legitimate security concerns, but to ensure that we do have the free and fair flow of people and trade over the border. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Uh, the last panelist today will be Catherine Brick Friedman. And as soon as she gets her, there she goes. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Well, first, I'd like to thank David and his team for extending the invitation to speak here today at the Woodrow Wilson Center. It's a personal honor for me to be here at an institution that embodies um, such tremendous ideals that I, I also share. Um, my, you just heard my colleagues present what, what I sort of view as an in the trenches or on the front lines perspective on WHTI implementation. And my intent here today is to take a step back and, and um, take maybe a 20,000 foot view of the issues surrounding the border between Canada and the United States. And I, I hope that I'm a bit provocative. Um, it, it's my intent that we move beyond the security economy dichotomy that has so characterized conversations and policy discussions regarding the international border, which by all accounts is critically significant to both Canada and the United States. And I'd like us to consider thinking about the border in, in a new light. In some respects, um, I may be suggesting a fourth model to consider in addition to those presented by Assistant Secretary Baker. Um, my, my remarks on WHTI and some of the recent research that my institute and the Border Policy Research Institute out in uh, Washington State will address um, the, the, the first theme of this conference this afternoon, which is confronting challenges. And then I will wrap up um, my time by discussing the second theme of the conference, which is measuring progress. So like, like Wayne, I'm a lawyer. And as a lawyer, I am trained to argue. And I'm here this afternoon to argue something that perhaps many of you in the room haven't considered before or haven't heard of. And it's certainly something that wouldn't be a very popular argument uh, in my neck of the woods, in a, in a border community. And that is that WHTI was masterful. It was a masterful stroke in one significant respect. There are four words in the WHTI legislation that in my view capture the reality of the relationship between Canada and the United States and North American integration and provide perhaps a new way to view North American governance. And the four words that I'm referring to, oops, you're all waiting. <laughs> oh, this one. The four words that I'm referring to are or other acceptable documentation. Now, in my view, these four words, whether intentional or not, 
have opened the door to regional solutions to international problems. These four words have allowed for the possibility of flexible border policy that engages state, provincial, and private sector actors who are, by most accounts, significant actors on the North American stage. It has been well documented by um, the Canadian government and, and scholars across a whole host of different disciplines that Canada-U.S. relations and North American integration more generally can be characterized as occurring from the bottom up. Now this is due to a variety of different reasons, not the least of which is that NAFTA was intentionally set up to be weak institutionally due to very real fears on the part of both the Canadian government and the U.S. government um, regarding ceding sovereignty to some sort of supranational entity. Well, when we pick up our magnifying glass and look at what's going on here in North America, we witness states and provinces, states and provinces in the private sector engaged in a broad array of multi-sectoral, bilateral, and functional relationships with their counterparts across the border. In my view, it is these sub-federal actors that serve as the defining feature of North American integration and hence should be considered as part of the calculus in coming up with solutions to border policy. Now, I am not suggesting that Ottawa and Washington devolve foreign policy making to the provinces and states. That is, that they don't fully devolve foreign policy making to provinces and states. But what I am suggesting is that a one-size-fits-all border policy is not an ideal because we are not dealing with a monolithic entity. As demonstrated by WHTI, regional flexibility is critical to ensuring both security and economic efficiency. And some of the research that we've conducted recently uh, with the Border Policy Research Institute actually reinforces this point. I handed out to you a, a policy brief that the UB Regional Institute worked on collaboratively with the Border Policy Research Institute at Western Washington University under the auspices of a newly formed uh, research consortium called the Northern Border University Research Consortium, and Burke, <laughs> for short. And the mission of this consortium is to provide policymakers with objective, credible research on the border and its effects on national prosperity. Now, I'm not going to go through the, the data and the analysis and the beautiful visualization of that data in that policy brief, but I think it's the conclusions of that policy brief are important and relevant to our conversation here today. That policy brief, our research suggests that differences in regional trade flows demand flexible policies. So, for example, whether the, the flexibility comes in the form of four words, such as those that are present in the WHTI legislation, or um, by providing uh, port directors with more flexibility through perhaps a uh, regulatory change, the key is that regional flexibility can enhance both security and economic efficiency. In our policy brief, um, you know, we, we gathered a lot of different data and analyzed that data, and it told some very compelling stories, one of which is that the fast lanes in both regions that were compared, um, util utilization of the fast lanes differ. I think the number is 5% of um, carriers going north to Canada utilize the fast lane out in Blaine, where in Buffalo it's 23%. Now, although you know, FAST is, is very successful at ports of entry like Detroit because it's heavily dependent on automobile manufacturing and just-in-time delivery. This program has not met with the same success in these other regions, so perhaps one recommendation would be for regulations to provide port directors with the authority to open up fast lanes to non-fast traffic, allowing lanes that are backed up to have an alternative 
uh, lane to get to get through the border, easing congestion, making the border more efficient. Um, you, you can read the the brief at your leisure. I guess the larger point is that language crafted in legislation that's relevant to the border should account for this reality of Canada-U.S. relations and the fact that North American competitiveness may not necessarily be enhanced by what I, as an attorney, view as more traditional international law mechanisms, mechanisms such as treaties and international institutions, but rather, paradoxically, in fact, focusing on regional sub federal networks. Now again, while that may sound complex and there were some of these issues brought up earlier, I think all it really entails is something as simple as four words or other acceptable documentation. Now just moving on to the second theme of the, pro of the um, conference, which is measuring progress, I just want to briefly um, inform you that we, along with the Border Policy Research Institute, are constructing uh, a border barometer. This is a policy tool that will provide border performance indicators and objective analysis to policymakers on border issues. The, the border barometer was born out of a frustration, a personal frustration on, on my part. Um, I had attended conference after conference over the past several years where literally one presenter would stand up and pound his or his, his or her shoe on the table and say, you know, if you don't do something about that border, the U.S. economy is going to suffer and the Canadian economy is going to suffer irreparable harm. And then quite literally, 20 minutes later, half an hour later, two hours later, other stakeholders would stand up and say, that border is working just fine. That border is working perfectly. We have nothing to worry about. And, and I sort of stepped back and my colleagues at the Border Policy Research Institute stepped back and said, well, what's going on? Do we have any objective measures on how the border is performing? So we are currently compiling some time series data, the preliminary results of which are contained in a policy brief that was released by the Border Policy Research Institute. I only have one. <laughs> Um, photocopy of that here. I, I couldn't get enough of them in time to bring to the conference, but if you're interested in some of the preliminary findings or just to, if you have an interest in what we are doing, you can go to their website, which is www.u, which is Western Washington University, dot edu back, backslash BPRI. And um, we are going to be working quite vigorously on this project over the next few months and are going to release the results at a conference here in Washington, D.C. that's going to be held um, sometime in late winter or early spring. So if you're interested in hearing more about that, I can ensure, I can ensure that um, you, you know, are, are aware of the, the date and the place. Is, is, it, is it? Okay. <laughs> okay. You've been, you've been in touch with David and Don? Okay. All right. Well, it's here, February 24th. That's great. That's great. Um, in, in the end, I, I just simply offer this quote, uh, which as, as I walked into the Wilson Center, I, I had never been here before, and I was reading um, Woodrow Wilson's remarks on the, on the wall. And, and, and he had stated, in essence, that the, the scholar and the policymaker are engaged in a common enterprise. And I encourage those of you who sit here inside the Beltway to consider, to continue to consider the ideas of scholars and stakeholders in all regions along the 49th parallel when thinking of Canada-US relations, border policy, and enhancing the economic competitiveness of the United States. For again, in my view, paradoxically, making the world's largest and longest common border more seamless may require thinking at a regional as opposed to a continental scale. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. I don't think any of us will read legislation again without some measure of prose and poetry found in it. Uh, usually I would take this opportunity, take the uh, moderator's prerogative and ask the first question, but. Uh, a lot of interesting things have been set up here, so I'd like to toss it out and uh, get some questions from the audience. If you could please introduce yourself and your association and ask a question. There's a question up here, I think. 
You? There was somebody I'm back there. Oh, I'm I'll sorry. Go, I'll go next. Sure. Uh, I'm Dave Jones. I am a retired Foreign Service officer, and this is a question for the uh, last uh, speaker. In effect, could you give us a quick pricey of the uh, results to which you uh, so interestingly alluded uh, for the uh, study of timing and uh, circumstances and uh, uh, obstruction at the border? With respect to the, po I'm sorry, the policy brief or the border barometer? The border barometer. Um, we really haven't come to any comparative results. Uh, uh, um, the Border Policy Research Institute simply began gathering some data on border issues or you know, trade and border flows out in that part of the country. Um, primarily, they primarily look at indicators or, or data sets that measure porosity. So, for example, the flow of goods and services over the border. They advocate for. Um, uh, coming up with a measure, a better measure of wait time at the border. Uh, we are interested in gathering data on infrastructure investments all along the 49th parallel so we can see where dollars are flowing and what people are getting, what sort of a return on investment for those infrastructure investments. We also have an indicator, a, a security indicator, and we recognize gathering data on this might be a little tricky. I should take a step back and, and tell you that the data that we are working with now is all publicly available. I mean, I think that th there is a lot of data to be considered on, in constructing these performance indicators, whether we're thinking of border porosity or infrastructure or security, but it's a little bit more labor intensive and hence a little bit more costly. So we're starting out um, simply looking at uh, uh, data that are publicly available and um, you know with respect to security it will involve working with the the regional offices of Customs and Border Protection to get data on the number of interdictions um, uh, at the border uh, related to um, not crime generally but if we could get data uh, that break it down by drug related versus terrorist related. Now I understand we're, we might be asking for a lot, but um, we're, we're, we're just going to start chipping away at this in a way that, that makes sense. And then once we gather the data on our end, the same data on our end, we'll be able to start telling a story. I don't have the story yet, but um, I'll have it in February. In February. <laughs> Uh, Ray Kozlowski, a uh, fellow of the Transatlantic Academy. But normally, um, I'm a professor at the uh, State University of New York at Albany. Um, and with that, Wayne, I, I've got a question about the process of trading in my license, say, for example, and getting um, the, the new EDL. So in terms of establishing my identity as a U.S. citizen, I can do that with, say, for example, a uh, New York uh, birth certificate, a, uh, what do you call it, official copy, right, because the birth certificate is in the hospital or whatever, official copy of my birth certificate. That's right, with Correct. a raised seal. With a raised seal. That's what I need to get. And what kind of identity? Or a passport. Or a passport. Well, the whole point here is I'm mean, doing you guys as an alternative to the passport, right? So I'm, I'm taking the option that you present here, right, say, for example. Um, how... What is the identification that's necessary to get that official copy? You usually have to write to the Bureau of Vital Statistics of whatever, you know, wherever you were born. For example, I didn't have a birth certificate. Yeah. It was amazing. I thought all my life I had a birth certificate. <laughs> and it was actually from Washington, D.C., yeah. a hospital that I don't believe is any longer here. It's called Garfield Memorial Hospital. Right. It was this big thing. It had my little paw prints on it. It was certified. It had all this stuff. I brought it into DMV, yeah. and they laughed at me. Right. <laughs> they said, that's not a birth certificate. That's a commemorative document yeah. that the hospitals give to you that's absolutely worthless. I was devastated. So was my mother. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had to write yeah. to Washington, D.C., and fill out their form, and there are third-party vendors that'll do this for you for yeah. a price, but me being me, I wanted to pay only $23 that they, they got out of me. Yeah. And I filled out the form and sent it in. I don't remember what the requirements were. I know I needed a photo uh, copy of my license and, and some other attestations that I did, and I got back a raised seal uh, birth yeah. certificate. 
The problem, of course, is that there's no, there's no database for these things and that every single county does it differently in the United States. And it's a mammoth problem. And the fraud involved in getting these documents is rampant. It's very easy to fake them. Mm -hmm. So it's a massive problem. And we try to do what we can in New York State by having six points of identity that you need to get any sort of a licensing document. Okay, so there's this, there's the six points of identity. So in addition to the birth certificate, That's if correct. I come in with my official raised, the birth certificate is worth zero points in New York State. It just zero proves, points. It just proves that you're a citizen. <laughs> that you're a citizen. Okay, but then if I have the other six points, then I have the collection. Then right. what are the other six points? Yeah, they're, they're they're things like uh, uh, they they can range from things as mundane as. Uh, uh, W-2 statements, uh, 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 mortgages, uh, anything that shows an address, a name on it, you need something with a signature, you need a social security card, an original social mm -hmm. security card, that's mm -hmm. one of the other points. Um, yeah. It's documentation to try to show that you are who you say you are. Yeah. I mean, that's the, without a biometric, let's be honest, yeah. that's the best you can do. I mean, the fact is that if we're really in this truthfully to verify who people were, we would get rid of all the documents and go to a database. Yeah. Because once you go to documentation, they can be, they can be, uh, uh, I, and the reason I just raise it is just to play devil's advocate here a bit, um, is I recall looking at the, the website for New York State, I think it was, uh, if I remember correctly, two um, utility bills or whatever you could use to establish your identity to get uh, a uh, uh, birth certificate copy. And so if I look at this now um, from the standpoint of, uh, of someone who wants to use the system against itself to get a legitimate document, this is the real challenge here. And it seems like what's happening in British Columbia and in Canada is to actually move to the vital records and to work on, on that system. Do we have anything somewhat similar in play in New York or anywhere else in the states to address that? I mean, it's been discussed, and I know that the uh, Department of Health has been working on trying to establish a registry for, for birth certificates. But as you can imagine, it's massively expensive mm -hmm. and a huge undertaking. And if anything, now the economy is going the other way. There's not a lot of money out there for, for uh, projects that are not core mission you know, <laughs> projects. So. Unfortunately, it's uh, you know it keeps taking a back burner, but I yeah. think it's still in the works. You know, when it when it comes to birth certificates, um, it's it's much more a, a state function than mm -hmm. in Canada, where there is some federal oversight of it. Um, and so, different states are different places along the way. California, yeah. for instance, they don't have per se a central database. You still have to go to the county you were born in. But all birth certificates in California now follow an exact same <laughs> format on a very similar paper. It just has a different county name at the top. Uh, there are some states in the union that actually do have a centralized database, but it really is up to the state at this point. Mm -hmm. If I could add in Quebec, it was the same issue with birth certificates where you had every local church handing out a birth certificate, yeah. and you can just imagine how many tens of thousands of different versions of work. Some, huh? yeah, so a yeah. few years ago, the provincial government tightened up and started putting in together some guidelines as to how they should all look and be regularized a little bit more. Uh, right there. Boyd Stevenson with the American Trucking Associations. My question is for uh, Deputy Commissioner Benjamin. Just uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you very much for uh, adding commercial driver's licenses to your enhanced driver's license uh, regime. Uh, we in the trucking industry very much appreciate that. I wondered if you could walk us through any sort of challenges or differences that you may have seen in coming up with uh, eCDLs versus regular EDLs as we prepare to work with the other states on getting uh, enhanced CDLs. Yeah, that's an area where I'm not an expert. So, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll admit it uh, right now. I know that in, in some respects, maybe in a lot of respects, it was easier because CDLs are so much more vetted uh, for everything else with the hazmat endorsements and, and, and the fact that uh, um, uh, they're very closely looked at, the exams that they have to take and everything else uh, that results in, in, in the licensing. Uh, it, was a, it was an easy push to, to make the 
to make uh, an ECDL. We also have uh, motorcycle licenses can be uh, also enhanced, uh, as can uh, non-driver IDs. Uh, we, we have that. And of course, there's no age limits on enhanced driver's license. We actually had a, uh, a nine-month-old that they took a picture of. I wonder how that picture's gonna look in eight years. <laughs> uh, and uh, a 93-year-old also. But uh, um, we have an expert, Kevin O'Brien, is, is our man in, in New York State, and uh, um, if you come talk to me later, I can, I can give you uh, his information, and uh, uh, I'm just not an expert on that area, so I apologize. Thank you very much. Sure. I think I saw Marianne back there. Marianne Rood, I represent the province of Manitoba here in Washington. And those of us that have been following the development of EDLs heard the wonderful success stories in Washington State and how fast the uptake was and how all of the interview spots uh, were filled very quickly. I'm curious to hear more about how things have gone in New York State, specifically in terms of uptake and interview rates and so on, if you could give us a, a breakdown on that. Sure, we don't use the interview process. We were able to convince DHS that the two-stop process that we use had enough security in it that we did not have to use the interview. Now, because of what I said, uh, where I explained that some of the counties, uh, a lot of the counties, run the DMV offices, some of the smaller counties don't have enough motor vehicle clerks to have a two-stop process, they will use an interview process. But we were very concerned. Our major concern was on wait times. We view customer service as extremely important, and we want to get people through the DMV as fast as possible. And we've had a mammoth success uh, with that since we had uh, uh, reinventing DMV in the early uh, 1990s uh, that really transformed our offices and, and cut the wait times down to, to less than a half hour for almost every transaction. So we were concerned that the EDL uh, wait times uh, would be bad. What, what happened, and this is a tribute to not only our operations people who trained our motor vehicle representatives and to the people who put the information on the website, and we've made it very, very clear uh, on our website that you have to be prepared before you walk into the office with an EDL and we put in a checklist, you check the boxes, if all the boxes are checked then you have the right documents then come in. Uh, but we went, ran through flow charts, we, we ran through all sorts of uh, preparation to make certain that this uh, flowed uh, very well. And, and then with the authentication equipment, that added a whole other dimension to it because we were authenticating the documents that came in and even the scanner, and we have a scanner attached to that because we're keeping the documents because it's one of the requirements, I believe, of Real ID and we want to make sure that if we ever go to Real, Real ID, and New York State has not signed on to Real ID, uh, that we have the equipment and that we're moving towards it because DHS considers witty as being a document that probably will be, tell me, uh, Colleen, if I'm overstating the case, but Real ID compliant at, at, at some point, hopefully. So we're trying to move so that we can uh, maximize our efficiency in terms of documentation. In any event, when we, when what happened was the economy hit a downturn, and in some ways that helped us because the sales of EDLs fell off somewhat and people started trickling in in a steady stream, but in effect, they were training our own people to do it in an efficient way, and we found that the, the, the wait times, for example, if you could get through a licensing transaction in between uh, three and a half and seven minutes, the, the wait times for an EDL turned into uh, between five and ten minutes, and that was acceptable to us. And uh, right now, it hasn't resulted in long uh, customer service uh, lines, and we've had really no issues in any of our offices. They've, it's really gone very smoothly. <coughs> when I did mine, uh, my transaction, it took about seven minutes. How many EDLs have been issued? 11,000. Shira Goldberg from the Embassy of Canada. A question for Ms. Friedman. 
um, notwithstanding the four magic words in the WHTI legislation, mm. how receptive do you think the U.S. federal government would be uh, to the flexible regional solutions that you advocate? Well, <clears throat> I, you know, I would, I am, <laughs> I, I am not. I, I am not a representative of the U.S. federal government. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, you would have to, you would have to ask some, someone representing the federal government. I can tell you this though that, um, it's the reality. I, I, I mean, the reality of Canada-U.S. relations is such that states and provinces do business all the time together across a broad a broad array of issue areas ranging from the environment to to security to um, trade I, I mean there, it, it's just the reality uh, the private sector is engaged in collaborations across the border with each other it's it's the reality. I, I, you know, whether or not the U.S. federal government, I, I think there's, it presents an opportunity for the federal government to leverage what is already taking place in a way that could be useful for coming up with better policy. Again, whether or not those four words were intentional or not, I think it provides an opportunity for the government to think creatively about ways to leverage these networks and these actors in this reality to accomplish better, not just border policy, but policy related to Canada-U.S. relations and North American governance. It's an opportunity, which I would encourage them to explore. You know, if I, if I can just jump in for a second, as much of a uh, critic as I often am about the way both countries have proceeded with this over the last five years, I think the EDL process shows that the U.S. federal government might be very open to different aspects of this. I think um, what what we've seen is um, uh, that as long as we can address the legitimate security concerns, if there are unique ways to be able to move forward on some of these things so that we do have that free and fair movement of people, there's at least an opening to have that dialogue. And I think that what the EDL process has shown us is, is from both sides, this is the path we can take. We now know what it looks like. Let's see if there's other things we can do that are comparable to that. I have a related issue to this. It's um, how did, on the state and provincial levels, what was the process of going working with the federal government? I mean, what kind of hoops did you have to jump through, or uh, what did you have to prove to them? How good were they to work with um, on getting this stuff done? I mean, because that says there's a lot that does happen on the on the federal, I mean, the provincial and state levels. A lot happens, and sometimes it often happens under the radar of the federal government. But this is something a federal requirement that you're saying, "Hey, look, we can do this." How did you convince them that you can do this? I think, you know, I mean, the two-stop is a great example of how flexible PHS was in dealing with us when we said we don't want to do the interview process, it's, it's going to screw up our wait times. Uh, we can't have 10-minute interviews with every EDL person that walks into a, a Department of Motor Vehicle office. It just won't work for us. We didn't like the appointment idea. It just didn't, it didn't work for, for New York State either. And so uh, we convinced uh, DHS that this two-stop was uh, secure and was a way to get around it, and they were flexible. We pushed back on a fair amount of things on the business plan and found DHS to be uh, willing to work with us, willing to sit down. Colleen was uh, uh, wonderful in working with uh, uh, Kelly smith Lois, who was our person who really uh, uh, worked the process, and a couple of our other people. And we hammered out agreements. And if you look at our uh, business plan, for example, and compare it to Washington states, you'll see, you'll see large differences in it uh, and, and significant differences. And there's significant differences in, in, in the way the EDL is made, the substrates and, and, and the way it's put together. So I think that the process has, has worked very well. The very fact that we were able to do it within a year 
is absolutely amazing. It's a testament to the fact that not only could we work with DHS, but we also worked with the Providences and, and met with them and had conference calls with them on an ongoing basis to look at their concerns and what they needed. And um, so uh, we were extremely pleased with the process. Now that doesn't mean that it was all, you know, it was all without bumps in the road. There were bumps in the road, and some of them were significant bumps in the road. Um, you're dealing with uh, uh, very high-level people who understand um, in a very real way what's going on, as somebody said, in the trenches. And that's true. I mean, uh, you wouldn't believe what our operational people know about adding seconds to a transaction, literally seconds. It's like what the RFID does. You know, it takes seconds off a transaction coming through a bridge. Those seconds add up to hours, okay? It's the same thing in a DMV. You start adding seconds to a transaction, you end up with somebody 20 minutes, uh, having to wait 20 minutes more, and then it becomes an hour. So they looked at all that stuff, and, and they scoped it all out, and they went through test after test after test to do this, and um, thankfully, uh, it all works. And there were some bumps in the road, as I said, and even operationally, there were some bumps in the road, but we, we managed to get over. I think from our perspective, as sort of the guinea pigs in all this, the, the biggest issue was uh, trying to get from the state and from the federal government, get everyone's head around, how do we allow a state to essentially adjudicate citizenship? Because that mm -hmm. was yeah. anathema. Um, and it's not, I think even the way that I've just described it is probably making several people in the room go, because eh, it's not adjudication. But um, get, trying to figure out that process was probably the biggest issue. Once we got past that, um, I think the federal government had been talking quite a bit about, let's get Washington State done and use them as a roadmap for everyone else. And what New York did a great job of doing is saying, yeah, but we're not like them. We need something that fits more with us. And so they were able to go through and make some changes to it, like, for instance, the, uh, the interview process. For us, it was a reason for people to get it. For New York, it didn't work. But you know, making sure that there was flexibility in that, I think, is now, as other states get into the process, is going to make that uh, negotiation a lot easier. So. I would like to point out also, and I'm sure Ken will probably back me up on this, it took a while to get to that point before everybody kind of said to themselves, WHTI, as it's written, it's just not going to work. And there was a lot of lobbying, there was a lot of going to the Hill, there was a lot of going to DHS, to state, talking for everybody involved and saying, look, you've got to expand the doc, you got to expand what counts as WHTI compliant documentation, those four magic words. And you're right, because they did actually set off a sequence of events, which meant that after years of finally going up to the visits, going to meet everybody you talk to and say, you know, you've got to say something else can work as well as a passport, then you get to that point. And the rest kind of fell into place. Of course, sometimes, so Michael, I, I get the feeling that maybe uh, we, we got to the EDLs mostly because they just didn't want to hear from us and they were sick and tired of us <laughs> hassling them. So. We were very nice people. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, uh, I'll ask the one last question because I want to. This is something I've been thinking about. What would you like to see in the northern border in the next four years? If you could have a wish list of some sort of magical fog to sit upon Washington and give you unlimited powers and basically you could write a check, what would you like to see? Just one or two things. What would make your lives easier? If you could just go up to a pre president elect Obama and <laughs> secretary uh, Eli uh, about to be a Napolitano and say, this is what I would like. Well, and it, you know, and it, it, this is, this is, not very sophisticated, okay? But everybody realizes, of course, that when we're talking about EDLs, we're talking about people coming back into the state from Canada. Mm -hmm. What happens when you go over to Canada with an EDL, okay? Well, it doesn't, you know, they don't have RFID readers, obviously. They don't have access to DHS's database. They never would. Uh, but there could be greater facilitative technology that could speed entry into Canada with uh, EDLs. And indeed, Quebec, of course, is, is, is well into the process of, of having an EDL. And uh, coincidentally or not, they're using the same vendor that New York State uses. So there will be some compatibility, at least, uh, with the design of, of the document. But um, it seems to me that y you probably need uh, porous borders both ways. 
Uh, well, I smiled a little bit when Michael asked that question because I'm in a little bit of a different situation than Wayne you, and You problems, so you've got <laughs> stuff to do, Catherine. Well, no, I was thinking to be appointed a cabinet-level <laughs> physician. And, and, uh, um, no, um, I, I, it's, it, seriously, I, I would like to see the new administration consider uh, new ideas for engaging Canada and thinking about North American governance. I... Um, you know, I'm 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 a, a little bored with the ideas that we need to create some sort of institutions and that we need to renegotiate NAFTA and and I just think that those options are problematic for a lot of different reasons and and so I would encourage the incoming administration to consider alternatives such as leveraging some of these networks, thinking about, you know, in the international law literature, we call them transgovernmental networks at the federal level. And, and you know, I mean, right, it's like where all the harmonization of the rules and regulations is taking place. But also, um, again, leveraging some of those uh, networks at the state provincial level and, and at the, um, engaging the private sector in a way to come up with a new governance framework for North America because it is a little disconcerting that at a time when other countries are breaking down barriers uh, to trade and the, you know, the flow of goods and services and people across the border that you know, we're, we're building barriers in, in a whole host of different ways. And, you know, from an economic competitiveness standpoint, we will lose. You know, we will. I mean, there's no doubt about it unless we get creative. So. Well, I'll be marginally objectionable as always. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, if I had my druthers, uh, what I would love to see is uh, um, uh, more of an integration uh, in North America. And I'm not talking common currency or anything, and I know that Folks in Ottawa are always concerned about sovereignty, so I don't want to step on that. But I, I feel like, um, as, we, as, as Catherine mentioned, as we look at what's going on in Europe with the opening of borders, finding some way to be able to address that here, where Ottawa worries a little less about sovereignty, the U.S. worries a little less about security, and we agree on who we're going to let into North America. So we put less of an emphasis on the 49th parallel. It makes a lot more sense to me. Um, you know, a great example of problems we have is that in Vancouver, we're, we're building a new uh, um, uh, transit line uh, from the airport into downtown Vancouver that we're going to have done in time for the Olympics. Um, it was less expensive and easier for the, uh, the contractors to import labor from Moldova than it was to bring up people in Washington State who could have gone up and worked on that project. Um, you know, because uh, construction workers aren't part of NAFTA, then you know none of the NAFTA rules apply. It doesn't make any sense that we're not always looking for ways to try and make this a more open relationship. Because the days of our economies being so diametrically opposed are gone. Um, you know, uh, Canadians are very fond of saying the U.S. Uh, uh, gets a sniffle and Canada catches a cold. I mean, you know, when times are good, they're good for both. When times are bad, they're bad for both. And so all of these things that we continue to put up on this random line that we've drawn on the map uh, do us no good. Uh, we need to address sovereignty. I'm not suggesting that we stay away from that, but uh, finding ways to continue to in integrate would certainly make the business community a lot happier. Sir, anybody who has a last comment or question? No? Well, thank you again to all the panelists. It was uh, very enlightening.